welcome you to Sunday morning's uh, edition of the Navigator's Bible Class. We are uh, currently studying a series called The Destinies of Men. The Destinies of Men. We have this chart available. If you do not have one, we printed others this week so that you might have it. Um, <clears throat> Um, does anybody need one? Thank you. Okay, well, Diane is passing them out to you. Uh, this chart is meant to be a, a reference for you um, in, in your Bible study, and I hope it, hope it helps organize things for you. Uh, the destinies of men... <laughs> is uh, designed to um, look at uh, five groups of people and where they will be, what their destinies uh, will be. The lost we've already taken, that's your top bar, that gray bar. We've looked at Old Testament saints. Uh, last week we looked at New Testament saints, uh, the, uh, otherwise known as New Testament age saints, church age saints, and we, we notice that there are a number of unique, unique things about church age saints that differ from all others. Um, after mentioning that last week, I got to thinking that each group is unique in a way, uh, but uh, the church has some things about it that we looked at last week that can only apply to them. Um, Revelation chapter 2 and 3, um, John addresses these seven letters that are in these two chapters to the seven churches in Asia Minor. Uh, they are in type pictures of seven periods of the church age from the time of the resurrection of Christ until the rapture. It pictures seven periods of time there uh, that the church goes through. It has uh, several other applications too, but I just wanted to mention that to you. We did a study uh, several years back on the seven churches of Asia Minor, and I just wanted to mention that uh, as, we, as we went. We discuss the death of church age saints. Those today that are believers in this day and age, when they die, uh, Paul says, is to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And while the body is buried, our soul goes to be with the Lord. We talked about that last week. And uh, after the rapture here, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, when we go to be with the Lord, those of us who are alive when that event happens, we will all meet and we will go to, in heaven, to uh, what uh, Paul refers to as the judgment seat of Christ, where God will reward us for things that we have done for the Lord. And um, so... Uh, Last week we concluded our uh, talk about the destiny of church age saints even into the future and beyond in eternity the things that we're going to be doing. And um, I can't review all of that, uh, but uh, we're going to have quite a list of duties and things. Uh, we will not be bored by any stretch of the imagination Eternity with the Lord will be exciting <laughs> to the point of where um, that song I could never have imagined right. will be true. Uh, going on, we began to study tribulation saints last week. That, uh, that refers to those who are saved during this seven-year period. We're going to continue with that today, and um, 
one of the important things is to understand the characteristics of this time. This time is going to be different more so than any other period in history, these seven years. And so if we look briefly at the characteristics, uh, we will begin to understand what these believers have to go through. Now, uh, last week we looked at this particular slide that's coming up, so we'll review it really quickly. Uh, this, these times will be the most violent and the wicked ever. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. In other words, leading up to this event are going to be like the days of Noah and the days of Lot. And they were wicked, violent days. If we think we have it bad morally today, it's going to get much worse. And as we see that crescendo beginning to take place, or not even beginning, or continuing to crescendo, we must understand that God certainly will be sending Christ to get us soon. We believe that, we hope that we'll be very soon, and we pray for that. Uh, we looked at the details of the beginning of this time. What, what were the conditions like when this seven-year period begins? And they were, number one, the rapture has happened, which means all believers will be removed from the earth. No one there at, after this event will be a believer. There's a lot of consequences to that fact that we'll get into. Uh, this big lie will be presented. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 2 says that it will be presented and people will believe it. A lot of people will believe it. One of the lies were would be uh, a reference to where have all these people gone. Somebody's going to come up with something that they'll believe. Uh, also... This begins with this peace treaty that will be signed between the Antichrist or the beast and Israel. That is the event that actually begins the seven years ticking. That seven-year clock begins there. Yes, sir? That, that peace treaty, is the, the entire world signed that peace no. treaty? It would be strictly between Israel and this individual. They will put such confidence in this man that they will commit the safety of their nation to him and to his resources. And the whole globe's gonna. Um... No, the whole globe will not agree to that. Uh, this is strictly between them, but they are convinced that he will be able to protect him, although those around them are trying to invade or trying to get rid of Israel just as they are today. And at that time, Israel gets rid of all their war capability? The, yeah, at this time, they commit their resources militarily <coughs> to the beast. Okay, So that as in Ezekiel 38 says, they are dwelling in unwalled cities, which means their, their own defenses have been committed to him. All right. That, and they will recognize that three and a half years later when he breaks that treaty, they will realize what a mistake they have made. But this is uh, just setting up for this time. There are other characteristics of these seven years, and one of them is that God resumes his dealing with Israel. Turn, if you would, to Romans 9. Romans chapter 9. And uh, many of you understand that these three chapters, Romans 9, 10, and 11, are Paul's uh, 
information he gives about Israel, to Israel, about Israel. All his other writings pertain to the church, but Romans 9, 10, and 11 pertain to Israel. And because Paul has written all this stuff to the church, he's going to say what he says then in Romans 9. Look at verse 1. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also beareth me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. What he is, he is concerned uh, with uh, this, uh, with Israel. And um, he, he goes on to say, look at verse, uh, uh, chapter 11. Chapter 11, verse 1, he says, I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. In other words, Paul has written all this to the church. They are all concentrating on what he's saying about that. And then so he says, wait a minute. God has not forgotten about Israel. Now, at this point in time, during the church age, Paul introduces another mystery that concerns Israel. Look at chapter 11, verse 25. It says, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. He's fixing to tell you something that has not been revealed before this time. Lest you should be wise in your own conceits that blindness, blindness, in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. So he says, right now, as he's speaking, Israel has this aura of blindness over them. What's a blind person? Is someone that cannot see, that can't understand what this is. And Israel does not understand and cannot see what is going on here. As a nation, individually, there are many Jews who, like Gentiles, come to believe in Christ, see, but as a nation, Israel is still in darkness, in blindness. You go to Israel today, they do not recognize anything in the New Testament. Matter of fact, you could be persecuted if you have a New Testament in Israel today. All right? So they are blind concerned. They still reject Jesus Christ as their Messiah, just as they rejected him over here. And the last thing they said before he was crucified was his blood be upon us and our children. Therefore, bingo, blindness has occurred to them. And it says this blindness will continue until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Well, that will go all the way through here toward the end of the tribulation period. They will be blind. They will not understand what is happening spiritually, not only to them, but to the rest of the world. So God kind of puts them on the shelf, so to speak, sets them over here. Okay, I'll deal with you later, but for right now, I'm going to call out a people for my name. I will go to the Gentiles as well. I will go to everyone with the gospel of the grace of God, which is for everybody, you see. Anyone who believes, Paul said, will be saved. And that is being presented here. Now, when we are gone, bingo, at the rapture, God will again pick up his dealings with Israel. Um, 
I don't want to elaborate on that because that would take the rest of our time and several other class periods to, to get that. But if you study Daniel's 70 weeks in Daniel 9, chapter 9, says uh, 70 weeks uh, are, are dedicated to Israel for things that are going to happen to them. 69 weeks occur, uh, of years, seven-year periods, ended here. And this would be the 70th year. And all of this stuff has to take place here. So God dropped off his dealings with Israel here, overt dealings, okay? Now, God is always working in the world, don't you know? He is bringing about things that will result in, in his will happening. But the overt dealings with Israel begin again here, okay? Um, Hebrews, uh, we know Hebrews is direct dealing with Israel because in the book of Hebrews, the writer addresses this generation of Jews and says, don't you guys be like those way over in the Exodus days when you came out of Egypt because they didn't believe me. See? Don't fall into that trap of unbelief because if you fall in that trap of unbelief, You'll never enter my kingdom. All right, that's just setting stuff up. I will also mention in this uh, the general epistles. That's what the GE stands for. That's not general electric. <laughs> that's general epistles. The books of Hebrews, James, First and Second Peter, okay, First, Second, and Third John, Jude and Revelation, actually, some of that. These books, the general epistles, are doctrinally, doctrinally or specifically aimed at believers living here. Pauline epistles are specifically aimed at people living here. Don't mistake, uh, or don't have the mistaken notion that everything is doctrinally aimed at us. Now, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is viable to everyone for certain things. Inspiration, uh, uh, instruction, correction, these things. But not all scripture is written directly and everybody, when it says, do, as you read the general epistles, you'll see that they're beginning to be concerned about a lot of stuff that's going on. And that's one reason why we're bringing this introduction, is so you'll understand what these believers will be going through. This seven-year period focuses all issues in the world on this event right here. This is the main focus, not only of all the Bible, or 99%, 95% of the Bible, 90% of all prophecy is focused on this event, and consequently, the what leads up to this event, these years act like a big lens. You know how lens works. <laughs> Don't you, didn't you ever uh, take your big magnifying glass out in the hot sun and start a little fire with the leaves? <laughs> it focuses. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, this acts like a lens that focuses all events on that event there. All issues of humans. <laughs> the Gentiles, the Jews, history, everything leading up to this time comes to a head right there. 
So there's no wonder that more scripture is written about these times than any other time in history. Most of the prophetic books are concerned with these times. Yes, sir. Back to the treaty being signed, I got two questions on that. So does Israel recognize the beast as their Messiah? The Messiah? Some may. I, I don't understand it, This will be a political thing, not a spiritual thing. And, okay? Yeah, I don't understand how they could just willingly just turn everything over. Second, there. Second Thessalonians there's, there's 2 says God will send them delusion that they will believe a lie. Yeah. yeah. Okay? And on that timeline, at what point does the one world order come into play? Uh, it's, it's in the process of heading that way now. Okay. This guy, the beast, will try to establish that <coughs> one world order. Okay? He will almost, almost be successful, but he will not quite be, he will not be totally successful, okay? The one world order thing will never 100% catch on, okay? Close, but not, no banana. Now, if so much of scripture is aimed at these events, don't you think it's important for us then, if we're going to understand the Bible, to understand that? Since the big weight of Scripture falls here. So, studying this is something that we ought to do if we want to understand the Bible, if we want to understand what God is doing in the world today, to understand what he has done in the past and what he will do in the future. We're talking about the destinies of men. So we must understand the bulk of scripture is about the day of the Lord. Matthew 24 verse 14, we won't turn to it, but Jesus said that the gospel of the kingdom would be preached in all the world, and then the end would come. This gospel of the kingdom would be preached all over the world. Now, Paul's gospel is the gospel of the grace of God, which in a nutshell is uh, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved through faith. It's talking about the spirit spiritual, the spiritual stuff, okay? The gospel of the kingdom is about physical stuff, okay? And the good news, that's what gospel means, right? Good news. The good news that will be preached is, guess what? The king is coming back to set a kingdom up. That's what will be preached in all the world. Nowhere in Scripture was Paul's gospel promised that it would be preached in all the world. It may very well be, but that promise is not there. Jesus said this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world. And, um, well, let's go on. This we're well, we got a lot to do. The 144,000, you remember that number? You remember that bunch in Revelation 7 and Revelation 14? God will seal 144,000 people. And Revelation says those people, number one, are men. Number two, they're Jews. Number three, they're 12,000 from each tribe. And number four, they will not 
be able to be killed. They have the seal of God on them. Other than that, there's not a lot that Scripture says about them other than they will be sealed for this time. I'm going to tell you what Sandy thinks. <laughs> it's my opinion, okay? Uh, it's my opinion that these 144,000 are separated from God, uh, by God, for a purpose, and I believe that is to be witnesses around the globe. Because how in the world could that gospel be taken to the whole world unless there's some specific group that will do it? Yes, sir. Do you think that that is similar to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? Because in Thessalonians it says that he that hinders, hinders, is taken away. So the Holy Spirit at the rapture... The Holy Spirit goes that. out here. Right? Right. So will it be like in the Old Testament when they're given the Holy Spirit for a period The Holy of time? Spirit will be active here because people will be saved here. They are... <clears throat> they People are not being able to be saved other than by the work of the Holy Spirit. That's the only way people are saved by the work of the Holy Spirit. So if anybody's saved in here, and they are, we know the Holy Spirit is beginning his work here. Now, this 144,000, I believe, are going to be sealed before this starts. You notice that there's a gap between the rapture and this peace treaty being signed, which starts the seven years. This may be a who knows, a week, two weeks, two minutes. Nobody knows if there is a, uh, how much time happens in here. I don't think it's a big chunk of years. I don't think it's a long time. I think it's fairly short. But I believe that the 144,000 are sealed in here so that they will go out and preach that gospel. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is come, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, in Judea, and in Samaria, and where else? The uttermost parts of the world. The uttermost parts of the world. You know what the uttermost parts are? Everywhere on earth. Now that was given to whom? The disciples. How many of them were there? Twelve. Did those twelve do this? No. They started it. See? But this will be fulfilled here. Do you see? Uttermost parts of the earth will be fulfilled here. They begin their ministry. We're still just setting up the characteristics for what these believers will be dealing with. The man of sin, 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 3, will be revealed after the rapture, not before. He may be around. People may know this individual, but not know that he is the Antichrist or the man of sin. People have suspected, oh, they think this guy is it. They think this guy is it. They thought Hitler was it. Uh, you, you, you know what I'm saying? He very well may be alive today. And I kind of believe he is. But he will not be revealed as the man of sin until, until, he, uh, until after the rapture and he evidently moves quickly to sign this particular treaty. During this time, we will have the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven vials of Revelation happen. Those are accounts of God's judgments on the wicked that are living here. 
the seven seals begin here and go all the way, and the seventh seal is the return of the Lord. The seven trumpets, I think, begin around here, and the seven trumpet sounds here. The seven vials that God pours out his wrath probably start right here, and the seventh one is the return of the Lord. That will be the culmination of all these things. Again, I'm just bringing these to your attention. Yes? Um, with it, when um, Satan, well, excuse me, when um, the man of um, evil, okay, is, um, um, I don't know if he won't be acknowledged, but he will be supposedly there before that look at before the tribulation period is that uh, he's not recognized because he isn't dwelt with by Satan yet that I would that would take a lot of time to answer the question he, she's asking if the man of sin is not indwelt by Satan uh, until here uh, some say it's here uh, that is kind of a something else that we don't have time to get into. Uh, that's a good question, though. all right? When does Satan enter the man of sin? That, that, that's, uh, that's a good question, but we don't have time to really get into it today. Yes, Brian? Cindy, on this preaching, uh, if you look at Revelation uh, 14, 6, it says, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having an everlasting gospel. Is the gospel that we always had, everlasting gospel, to preach to them that dwell on the earth and to every nation, kindred, and tongue of people. That is a different nation. gospel. It's to fear God. That's something that has been preached, fear God, all along, but it is a different, different gospel other than Paul's gospel or the gospel of the kingdom. Okay? Um, believers, the ones that respond to this preaching of the 144,000, and as a result, they themselves become evangelists, and those they witness to and lead to the Lord become evangelists, and this spreads like this. There will be many that become believers during this time in spite of what's going on. Most of the believers during this time will be martyred. In Revelation chapter 6, you see um, uh, verse 9. Revelation uh, 6 verse 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal... I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they had. These are tribulation period martyrs. And they cry with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? That phrase, them that dwell on the earth, always refers to unbelievers. Okay? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. It's always been an interesting passage. These martyrs when they are martyred, it says that they are under the altar. You know where that altar is? Look at Revelation 8, verse 3. And another angel stood at the altar, this is in heaven, having a golden censer, and was given to him much incense that he should offer it with prayers of all saints. 
upon the golden altar. Notice, there's an altar in heaven, and that's where the souls of the martyrs go. They go to be with the Lord in heaven, and they are pictured as being at the altar praying okay, as they did at that time. Um, these martyrs are also mentioned in Revelation 7, verse 9. It says, After this, lo, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number of all nations, kindreds, people, and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white, white robes and palms in their hands. You see this bunch that no man can number. That means as you look at them, you can't count them. There's so many. There's a, just a bunch of people, and uh, you don't have time to sit there and count them all. Um, and John says, who in the world are these people? And the angel says, you know who they are. And he says, okay, who are they? And he says, verse 14, I said unto him, sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, these are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, uh, neither shall the sun uh, light on them, nor any heat. Uh, keep in mind, one of the plagues in the tribulation was the sun was so much hotter and would scorch people. See? That was one of the plagues. Uh, and so these are out, out of all these, these things here. And they are awaiting resurrection. And we'll see in a little bit where they are resurrected. These believers, upon death, the body will go to the grave and the soul will go to paradise. That is the presence of the Lord in heaven. We saw that before. This is true for all believers of all time. Whether it were Adam, Enoch, Enoch didn't die, okay, Methuselah, Noah, uh, David, Moses, any of Abraham, any believer died. This is true. They go, their soul goes to be with the Lord, their body is buried, awaiting resurrection or the reunion of the soul. Okay. The tribulation saints that die, it says they will complete the third phase of the of the third of the first resurrection. This is phase three here. The first phase of the first resurrection was the resurrection of Christ and Old Testament saints. They were the first fruits. The church age saints who are dead, who will be resurrected at the rapture, would be the harvest, the main thing. And then the gleanings would be the Old Testament, uh, no Old Testament, tribulation saints who have died <coughs> and the martyrs that would be resurrected. Okay, uh, we're going to have to stop here, but let me say these martyrs constitute a very special group. They are mentioned in Revelation 7. They are mentioned in Hebrews 12, 23, and it refers to them as just men made perfect or complete. In other words, their souls were in heaven, their bodies were in the grave, and they were made complete at that resurrection. See? So it would be the souls of just men made perfect at that resurrection complete see Psalms 116 verse 15 says precious in the eyes of the Lord are the death of his saints okay 
That is a principle that is true now, and it will be especially true for martyrs who have died because of his name and their testimony. Precious in the sight of the Lord are the death of his saints. Okay? So these martyrs will be a special blessed group. We'll find out next week that they will perceive what is known as the crown of life. Okay? We will continue with the destiny of tribulation saints and then next week we will get into millennium saints. Those that become believers who are born and become believers during this time, we will talk about millennium saints. So we again have four groups of saints. Old Testament saints, church age saints, tribulation saints, and millennium saints. Okay? Rightly dividing the word. That's our goal. Let's pray and we'll head out. Heavenly Father, we do thank you again for your word. We thank you that the book has all the answers. It's in the book. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that teaches us. We thank you for the sacrifice. Christ made for us. And our prayer is that, Lord, you would come quickly. For it's in his name we pray. Amen.